Let's give the Lord a hand and all those that are tuning in, welcome to our broadcast again today. So I've reminded you I'm in Ruth chapter number 1, beginning with verse number 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and to her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee. Or to return. That word return means to go back. Or to return from following after thee, for whether thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And watch what Naomi did. When she saw that she, referring to Ruth, was steadfastly minded that's what keeps you from going back to the world you got to be steadfastly minded about god and to go after her then she left speaking unto her she just quit talking and said i'm dealing with a woman that's made up her mind so today we'll close the series on i've come too far to turn back I related to you that in two days I'll be married, excuse me, be saved 46 years, uh, married 45, and preaching 44. And in this journey, there has been a lot of things that would have promoted me, prompted me, and pushed me to go back to what God saved me out of. But what brought Ruth to the place where she was willing to forsake her hometown, Moab, and leave it all behind as introduction let me give you three reasons number one because of the memories of the hurt and pain she had endured while she was in moab see the name ruth means pity distress and grief you gotta remember in less than 10 years this young lady at about 30 years old buried her father-in-law her brother-in-law and her own husband You see, Moab is a place of weeping. It's a place of bitterness. It's a place of perversion. You remember God wouldn't let Moses cross over into the promised land, but he let him go up on top of Mount Nebo and look over into the land flowing with milk and honey. And the Bible says that God performed Moses' funeral up on top of that mountain, and he never came down. And Joshua took over and took the people across the Jordan River. Do you know where Mount Nebo is? It's in Moab. One of the greatest patriarchs that ever lived died in Moab. And when he died, the Bible said the children of Israel sat down. Think about this. And they wept and cried for 30 days and 30 nights. The very foundations of Moab are sealed with bitter, stinging tears of anguish and sorrow. Who wouldn't want to get out of a surrounding that's filled with death? Who wouldn't want to get out of a surrounding that's filled with tears, anguish, hurt, pain, and sorrow. And when she saw what the world had to offer her, she said, I've had all this that I want. There's got to be a better day coming in my life. So it was because of the memories of her hurt in the past. Maybe she was ready to leave because of the mess that she saw concerning her future. You remember Moab is a place where no trust, no desire to live. It's a place of broken promises and empty dreams. Moab is so vile that twice in the Bible, in Psalms chapter 60 and in Psalms chapter 108, God called Moab his wash pot. It's a place of filth. It's a place where you work hard and accumulate nothing. It's a place of slime and decay. The reason why God called it his wash pot, Brother Randy, it holds the implication of boiling something on an open fire in a pot And you know how the scum comes to the top? You know how you rake off the scum? That's what God is implying Moab is. This world is nothing but slime and scum. And I hope our young people will have enough sense to listen to me and save you a lot of scars and regrets and heartache and pain. This world has nothing to offer you that's worth anything. 
10 generations. You've got to understand, Ruth is 10 generations from the illegitimate relationship between Lot and his daughter. That's where the Moabitess people came from. 10 generations had went by, and they're still living in Zoar and Moab. She saw that she was stuck in life. That she was just going to be a repeat of ten generations. You must remember, Brother Mark, because Lot committed incest with his daughter, God cursed the Moab people. They were a curse from God. They were so rejected by God that for ten generations, they were not even allowed to approach the tabernacle of God. They were alienated from God. So here's Ruth in her mid-30s, maybe even as old as 40 now, and she's looking at the mess her life is in. I'm filled with pain and heartache. It's been nothing but tears and anguish since I've been here. My future is I'm going to live and die just like the last 10 generations. And when she started looking at the long haul, she said, i got to find something better to do with my life. Let me tell you something, teenagers. If you're only going to have tunnel vision and look at today, you're going to be one screwed up kid. What you need to do is look at the long-term picture and realize the actions you do today are going to affect you 20 years from now. Are you listening to me? So if you'll look at life that way, it won't draw you to Moab. It'll make you want to get out of Moab. Now, here's the third one that I've never seen before. Not only because of the mess of what her future would be, but because of a message she got from another country. Now, I've never seen this before, Brother Evans, but think about this. The Bible said that Naomi is in Moab. She's been there for 10 years. And she left Bethlehem Judah, which means the house of God, the place of bread, because there was a famine in the land, according to chapter 1 and verse number 1. So Naomi's been gone 10 years. She's buried her husband and both her sons. She's got two widowed daughter-in-laws. Now listen to this terminology. And she heard in Moab... How that the Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. Somebody from Bethlehem, Judah, the house of God, said, you know what? There's some old, dirty, rotten, starving sinners on the other side of that mountain. And they don't know what they're missing. And they don't know how good it is. I'm glad somebody made that 10-day journey over those valleys on top of those mountains and went to a land where people were dirty and filthy and cursed and rejected and weeping and anguish and sorrow and pain and hurt and said, I got good news for you. Just over the other side of that mountain is a land that's fairer than day. It's flowing with milk and honey. And God has visited his people. You know what will get people out of Moab? It's for you and I to not isolate ourselves. But in our daily gatherings with people that don't know God, say, I got good news for you. There's a better land. There's a better life. And if... Oh, thank God for a messenger that brought the word of God to people that were cursed. They were cursed. So I've been studying history this week, and I'm not really fond of history, especially when you, when you have to read so much of it. Josephus and others, which were scholars back in their day of history, I've read all of that this week to just say this one statement. I've probably read five hours to say this one statement, so you better listen to me right now. (laughs) So, never is it recorded in the Bible, nor can I find it in any secular history where Ruth ever went back to Moab even for a visit. So there was something she did when she got away from the world that was so powerful that it kept her from ever wanting to go back to it again. See, you can get to a place in your life, if you'll stay with God long enough, you don't have to struggle every day to stay with God. See, the longer you stay sober, the easier it is to say no to liquor. The longer you stay away from meth and crack and pot, the easier it is to say no. Yeah, I know what I'm talking about. So, I want to find out 
what made Ruth stay with, with the things of God the rest of her life. She was only 35 or 40, and she lived to be an elderly woman, but she never went back to what God brought her out of. That's what I want to seal in your heart today in closing. What was it she did that sealed her to never go back and turn away from God? I want to give them to you quickly. It's chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm going to mention to you, and I'm going home. Number one. Chapter number one, she was committed over the way she felt. You've got to take commitment over emotions. I've shared with you that there's seven attributes in the human body. The least trustworthy is emotions out of the seven. And that's the one we lean on the most. How many times do you hear people say, well, I just don't feel. You don't feel? You mean out of all the attributes that God's put in you, seven of them, you're going to lean on the one that you can't trust the most? So what kept her going when she didn't feel like going? You can imagine a seven to ten day journey, brother. And every day was nothing but harder than the day before as far as her journey to get to God. It was hot. It was dry. Think about this. They were walking by the Dead Sea. They had to cross it. But it was salt water. They couldn't drink it. Can you imagine walking across the dry, barren desert in the Middle East and seeing that foamy water bounce up against the shores only to make you more thirsty because you can't drink it? She got dirty. She got sore. She got tired. She got weary. She got hungry. She got lonely. I'm sure her, her feelings would rise up every day and say, stop this nonsense. Go back to Moab and live your life like everybody else. But she would get up with determination the next day, thinking that this hill was going to be the last one. But when she topped it, she was dismayed to find out there was only going to be another one. Every time you see Ruth for 10 solid days, she's either sliding down in a valley or giving it all she's got, climbing up a hill. And above all of that, when she would lay down at the sky that was quilted with the stars and the moon, she would think about how homesick she was for her family and her friends. But she pursued on because the commitment she made to Naomi, I'll go where you go. I'll live where you live. Your God will be my God. I'll die where you die. Even when she didn't feel like it, when she would lay down and she would be tired and dirty and sore and weary, she would remember that commitment she made that I'm not turning back. I'm going to live where you live. I'm going to lodge where you lodge. And I'm going to die where you die. I'm going to tell you why to keep you going for God. I'm not asking you if you love God. I'm asking you, are you committed to God? Because commitment will stay when your emotions change. I think I've shared this before. Brother Nick and Miss Whitney got uh, married not long ago. We didn't have a public commencement service for them to fall in love. They were goo-goo-eyed for months. You couldn't even talk to them, all glassy-eyed, foaming at the mouth. You know how it is, just crazy. Not listening to anything you say, just out there in Gaga land somewhere. They were madly in love. So if love constitutes a marriage, why did we even have a ceremony? They were already in love, so I guess, according to some, they were already married. When you have a marriage ceremony, it's not to release the fact that you are now in love. You've been in love. It's given a public commitment. And that commitment is to shun all others, to love and to hold and to cherish that's what you're committed you didn't say that because you had to love her you automatically loved her but we have a service because we want it on record that you said you would be with her through sickness and health richer and poor good times and bad times and you make that public commitment so trust me there are going to be days when you are not in love with who you're married to you hypocrite, don't you look at me like that. I'll give your wife a microphone right now. <laughs> so there are days when you don't feel in love. It doesn't feel like a honeymoon. It doesn't feel like the first time. But you get up and go to work, and you sit down at the table, and you eat together, and you spend the evening together, and you go to bed together, and you get up together, and you do the next thing. Not because there's love or emotion, but because you made a commitment. Whether you feel like it or not, I've made a commitment. Whether it's good or bad, I made a commitment. Whether it's sunshine or not, I made a commitment. Whether I'm healthy or not, I've made a commitment. Whether I'm wealthy or not, I've made a commitment. I tell you, I'm sick of people telling me how much they love Jesus, but there's no commitment in 
in their life to go with him and never turn back again. We need a revival of commitment. So what keeps you from turning back? Commitment. And then one morning, when she felt like she couldn't go another day, could it be she quoted Martin Luther King on April 3rd, 1968, when Ruth topped that last mountain and saw that Jordan River and a land blessed of God flowing with milk and honey and fields filled with barley and wheat like she had never seen before. Could it be, she said, as Mr. King said on that day, and I quote, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter to me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop and I have seen the promised land. End of quote. And brother, you may get tired and weary on the journey, and your commitment way, may run thin, but about the time you can't take it another day, the Holy Ghost will put you on top of a mountain and show you a place where you can go, where there's comfort, where there's rest, where you can be fed, where you're protected, where you got security. You can say what you want. I'm not quitting. I've been to the top of the mountain. I have seen the promised land, and I'm committed to the cause. You want to never turn back to the world? Stay committed to God even when you don't feel like it. Number two. Chapter number two, you not only have to have commitment, but in chapter number two, you have to have involvement. Involvement. Now, when she gets to Bethlehem, Judah, which means the house of God or a place of bread, watch this, Brother Ed. The first thing she does is she picks up a bag and she goes out in the field and starts gleaning out of the barley fields. Now, here's what gleaning was. When the reapers would come through, Brother Danny, and they would reap the barley out of the field, they had big bags that followed them, like cotton pickers. And they would pull that wheat and barley and put it in the bag. Well, along the way, Brother Spears, they would drop some of it accidentally on the ground. And God gave them a commandment, when you drop it on the ground, leave it. Because there's strangers in the land. There's poor people in the land. There's homeless people in the land. Don't bow down and pick it up. Leave it on the ground and let them glean. That was the word. Let them pick up the stuff that you've dropped. So here's Ruth, a Moabitess woman. For 10 generations, her family has been away from God. It, her whole family was started because of incest. For 10 generations, she's been pitiful, distressed, and filled with grief. But she's got the church now. Chapter number one, her commitments got her to Bethlehem, Judah. And without anybody asking her, she said, if I'm not going to go back to Moab, i got to do something. i got to get involved with what's going on in Bethlehem, Judah. I'm going to tell you what will keep you from going back to the world. Get involved in the church. Find something you can do in the church. Now watch this. Brother Collins, what she did brought no spotlight. What she did brought no glory. She was never mentioned from the pulpit. She never carried a microphone. She never had the limelight. She was not a good singer, evidently. Nowhere in the Bible does it say she ever sung a song. But she said, whether, I, whether I'm noticed as being important or not, I got a job to do. I want Bethlehem Judah to know how much I appreciate it being here for me. You brought me out of a mess, and you give me a brand new beginning, and now I want to give something back so the messenger can go back and tell them in my homeland that the God that saved me is the same God that can save them. <clears throat> and without any coaching, she puts that bag and drags it and just picks up the gleanings, picks up nothing. They said what I could read in history that if you went out at daybreak and you gleaned until evening, you would have just enough barley to make a cake or just enough wheat to make one loaf of bread. All day long she worked without recognition. I've learned this in pastoring. If people come and say they get saved and they do not connect to the church community and the assembly within six months, they're not staying. They're not staying. If they come in at the last moment and they're the first ones out the door, I'm telling you, six months from now, they're going to be gone. They're not going to stay. you got to make connection. you got to get involved. 
there is something everybody can do. Now, it may not be recognized from the pulpit. You may not be on television. It may not be the limelight. But somebody's got to vacuum the floors. Somebody's got to change the lights. Somebody's got to cut the grass. Somebody's got to clean the toilets. Somebody's got to do maintenance. Are y'all with me now? Because getting involved is where it's at. You say, can, can just doing a little something make you a difference? Let me tell you something. 46 years ago in two days, I started out as a new born-again Christian in church with a paintbrush. And I painted everything my pastor wanted painted, and I painted stuff he didn't want painted. But I was down there by myself working the 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning just wanting to do something for God. I didn't need to be recognized. Nobody had to see me painting. Nobody was there when I painted. I went down there all by myself. And my Christian life started with a paintbrush in a church in the middle of a ghetto at 3 o'clock in the morning with a 4-inch brush. That's where my Christian life started. But you know what God did? God took me from a painter and made me a preacher. And for 44 years now, I've been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ all across this world but it didn't start out with a pulpit it started out with a paintbrush you got to get involved you got to you got to do something for God but here's somebody said you know I don't know why they go down there let me illustrate I'm gonna take a minute you didn't know this but when we got here today nothing worked nothing worked just like a mother-in-law goes out when you need it the most (laughs) nothing worked just everything was dead. At 10.30, this place was dark. Was I right, Brother Mark? Lights wouldn't come on. Only half the lights came on. None of the PA worked. We had no speakers. We had no sound. We had no power. We had nothing. So from 10.30 this morning to about 11.15, Brother Mark and Brother Chris was crawling underneath this platform tracing wires one at a time. When he came out, Brother Chris was so sweaty, he looked like a Democrat on election day. That's what I told him. (laughs) He was soaking wet with sweat when he come out from underneath there. And Brother Mark, he needs to practice on backing up because he is not a good (laughs) backer-upper. Miss uh, Lisa, get him a camera that's strapped to his rear where he can learn how to back up when he's under a stay. i never seen a man bump around so much stuff in all of my life. But see, you didn't see these men soaking wet with sweat at 10.30 this morning. All you see them is sitting behind a quarter of a million dollar computer system to put us on television. All you see is Brother Mark sitting on the drums. But you don't know these men were crawling on their hands and knees so we could have a PA system and have lights on in the auditorium. Do you see what I'm saying? And there's many other jobs and positions that I can mention. I can't mention them all. Brother Glenn has given his life. Him and Brother Danny are down here every week doing something for this church. It's unbelievable what some of these men do. And somebody said, why would you do all that? We have ladies that clean this church every week, and most of you don't even know who they are because they don't care if they're recognized. They don't want to be recognized. Why do you do stuff like that when there's no recognition? I'll tell you why. Ruth's walking down an aisle one day, and she's got a little feeble handful of barley. She's been out there all day in the burning hot sun. And she's thinking, man, I don't know if it's worth all this. Nobody even knows who I am. There's no recognition. I want to get involved, but I don't even know what's, what's going on. But what she didn't know is at the end of that row was a man named Boaz. And he owned the field she was gleaning in. He stopped the service and said, who's that girl picking up that barley down there? And they said, oh, she's a cursed, God-forsaken, Moabitess woman. He said, I tell you what you fellas do. Go tell her not to glean in anybody's field but mine. Because she was willing to pick up what nobody else wanted. She was willing to clean up what nobody else was interested in. You tell that little feeble, cursed, mobitis woman not to go anywhere but my field. And then here's what I want you to do. I want you to get on the same row she's on. And I want you to dip down in that barley bag. And I want you to start throwing out handfuls on purpose. Hey. I'm going to tell you why we crawl under the platform. I'll tell you why we cut the grass. I'm going to tell you why we swab a toilet. Because every once in a while, God looks down our row and tells the Holy Ghost they're not getting the recognition they deserve. I want you to drop a handful on purpose. I want you to do something special. I'm going to tell you why we do it. You don't know what you're missing by not getting involved. There's a God in heaven that's got a great big hand and he knows how to shower on his people. 
So in chapter number one, you got to be committed. Chapter number two, not only commitment, there's got to be involvement. I got to hurry and close. Chapter three, there's got to be an attachment. So she found out that Boaz was sleeping one night in a thrashing floor of a barley field. Now that's important because they grew two grains in Israel. The wheat was for the wealthy people and the barley was for the poor people. So all night long, Boaz is in the thrashing floor in the barley thrashing floor. So he is preparing stuff for poor poor people. He knows there's rich people, but he's got a special place for poor people. And he said, I want everybody to know that I want to supply a place for those that are poor as well as those that are rich. And so the Bible says that he had fallen asleep on the thrashing floor in the middle of the night. And Ruth walked in and saw him. And she dared not disturb him. She surrounded with barley, reminding her that she's poor. You're poor. You're a nobody. She said, I not only want to be committed, I not only want to be involved, but I want to be attached to him. And the Bible said she lifted up the base of his garment and pulled it over her. And here's what the Bible said. She laid at his feet all night long. You know what keeps you from going back to the world? Get attached to God. Get in fellowship with God. Spending time with God is one of the best investments you'll ever make. That one-on-one private time between her and her master. I was praying one day, my grandsons was over my house, and they're heathens. Pray for them. They're absolute heathens. And especially my youngest grandson, Kason, he's a he's Phil kid made over. Please pray for him. Please. Oh, God save him. So I was in my room one day, and I was praying. My wife, everybody knows, my first hour of every day is me and Jesus. That's it. You're not going to get that time from me. So I'm with my Jesus time, just pouring my heart out, just sitting at his feet, just wanting to be alone with him. And all of a sudden, there's a knock at my door. Well, I don't answer because I'm talking to him. So I don't care who's at my door. I'm talking to him. So I keep praying. All of a sudden, I said, I'm not answering. Jesus, I'm sorry, but we've got to finish this thing now. There's some other people I want to tell you about. And so I'm praying. All of a sudden, the door opens up. My grandson said, Papa, what are you doing? I said, son, I'm praying. I'm spending time with Jesus. So he went out and he closed the door. Two minutes later, he opens the door again and said, Jesus just told me you've prayed enough. It's time to play with your grandkids. (laughs) Has your kids ever caught you praying? Have they ever seen you take your alone time with God? I'll tell you a woman that really impressed me, and I'm going to go over time a little bit, but I I apologize ahead of time. There was a woman named Susan Wesley. She was the mother of John Wesley. And the Wesley brothers came to America, you know, through the Methodist Church and brought a great revival back in the 1800s. So John and his brother came, and two of the greatest fireball preachers the Methodist Church has ever known to this day. Did Did you know Susan had 19 children? 19! And they were all by Samuel Wesley, her husband. Can you imagine having 19 kids in the 1800s? You don't have a washing machine, honey. You don't have a vacuum cleaner. You don't have a microwave. You got a wood stove. You clean clothes with a rub board, and I've seen that done, by the way. I remember my mamma doing it to her fingers bled. I've seen that. She has no air conditioning. She has no heat. She probably has a dirt floor. 19 kids. What in the world? But did you know when she had 19 kids, this is what her son, John Wesley, said about her. He said, every day of my life growing up, my mother would put the babies to bed, set us children down, and say, I don't want to hear a word. And she would sit in her rocking chair. Every day of my life she did this. She would sit down in a rocking chair and pull her apron over her head, and for 30 minutes she sat there alone. Later, when John grew up, he asked his mother, Mama, why did you put us all to bed and make us sit down and put that apron over your head? He said, for 30 minutes you did that all my life growing up. She said, that was my God time. God, God time? You mean a woman 
Are, are you, and you trying to tell me you don't have time for God? You mean a woman with no vacuum cleaner, no washer and dryer, no air conditioning heat, and 19 kids raising them by herself while her husband's out trying to make a living for that clan? And, 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 and did you tell me my schedule's too busy, I don't have time for God? i tell you what you ought to do. You ladies need to get you an apron and sit down in a chair somewhere and 30 minutes a day put it over your head and make that your God time because it'll keep you from ever going back to the world when you get attached to God. You got to get attached. Number four, there's got to be excitement. Did you know the day Ruth got married, the day her and Boaz got married, that night, the first night of their marriage, she conceived a baby. And the baby she conceived, they named Obed, O-B-E-D. The name Obed means worship, to be excited. See, if you're going to really stick with God, yeah, you got to have commitment. you got to have involvement. I understand that. you got to have attachment. But there's got to be some excitement. There's got to be a time when you get plugged into another world and you just forget about all the anguishes and the disappointments in life and say, you know what? It's a good God. This is Thanksgiving. You've been better to me than I deserve. All of us ought to be in hell with our back broke today. And I'm telling you, if that can't bring a tear to your eye or an amen to your lip or a clap to your hand, there's something bad wrong with you. Many a Christian have drifted back in the world because they've never learned to worship God. It's such an important part of our Christian life that's why we're commanded to worship the Lord you are instructed to worship the Lord he's worthy of all of our praise he inhabits the praises of Israel God likes to see you excited over the fact that he brought you out of nothing and put you in the middle of everything oh can somebody help me preach today I say it excites God when he sees you excited about where he brought you from, where you are, and where you're headed. So you get in excitement. You worship him in spirit and truth. Let me close with this. So all the descendants of Ruth, her genealogy was the descendants that wiped out all the descendants of Orpah from the Philistines. Let me tell you something about serving the Lord. This world does not care how long you've been on the journey. You're not impressing them. They're waiting for that day when you turn back. Let me illustrate, Brother Adam. Tonight, there will be hundreds of millions of stars in the sky tonight. Hundreds of millions. Beyond galaxies and universes hundreds of millions and people will walk by those hundreds of million stars and never say a word but let one fall just one out of a hundred million let one fall oh look at that star it's falling all the attention always goes to the one that's falling they don't care about the one standing they just want to make note of the one falling but by the grace of God, I'd rather crawl out of here on my belly like a snake and die in that parking lot than to be the one that falls. I want to shine. Whether I'm appreciated or not, I want to shine. Whether people notice me or not, I want to shine. I don't want to be a falling star. I don't want to be a used to be. I don't want to be a has been. I don't want to go back to what he brought me out of. I want to stay in my place. I want to stay in my place. People only notice those that fall so I want to say to my people get committed get involved get attached get excited and you'll never look Moab's way again much less allowed to ever be in your life let's give the Lord a hand thank you for being here today